grid. We, we knew after the morning that uh, we will be very competitive. So we were, first run, we immediately set the, the pace and uh, I was surprised that it got so tight when Ralph uh, did his lap, especially from Ralph's side. I didn't expect him to be so close to us. But then we were able to improve and uh, had a safe uh, position. Congratulations, Ralph, alongside your brother again. Yeah, I mean, uh, especially after the two days of free practice we had and uh, the pretty poor results we had in the first few days and a few, few, few trainings, I think we um, are a bit surprised that we are all of a sudden there, but I think we got the best out of our package and some others seem to struggle a bit to do so. It was a messy session, so I don't think we got the most out of the car, but I, I still think the Ferrari qualifying uh, would have been beyond us. That, that's something that they've shown this year. They've tended to be a little bit stronger in qualifying, possibly, than we have. So um, not, a, not a big surprise there, but it's really just an unknown whether, how good we can make the car for race conditions. Not a good afternoon, actually a horrible one. I guess frustrating is the word. It is, it is frustrating because it's a track that I enjoy so much. It is a place that I enjoy so much, and uh, maybe God is reserving something for me. And uh, race starting in 35 minutes time, I would think Ferrari are probably sitting back and enjoying the battle between uh, McLaren and Jaguar for the services of Adrian Newey. Newey accepted as the top designer in Formula One. What's happened so far is that Jaguar announced he was going to join them next year. McLaren then said he is staying put with them as technical director. And now it's all in the hands of the lawyers. Personal friendships being tested to the limit. James Allen reporting. Adrian Newey and Bobby Rahal go back a long way, 17 years in fact, to when Newey engineered Rahal's victory in the Indianapolis 500. Ever since Rahal's arrival in Formula One, there's been speculation he would woo Newey to Jaguar, and for 48 hours he thought he'd pulled it off. It's a sad tale of double dealing and a shattered friendship. Adrian was excited, we had dinner on uh, Tuesday night and after signing it and went to a restaurant and asked it and drank some champagne and everything, excited about the future, and uh, yeah, I mean, I felt that uh, I was very pleased with the commitment that he was willing to make, and because I understood it to be a big change for him. But it was a change that McLaren weren't willing to accept, and they forced Newey to go back on his word. Ray Hall was gutted. I'm tremendously uh, disappointed, uh, because friendships are based on trust and uh, good faith, and um, you know, caring, I suppose. Uh, but in the world of Formula One, those things, those attributes don't have a lot to, of, uh, of relevance or credibility, obviously. Um, I think they do in life. And so personally, I'm very disappointed, but I'm a big boy and, you know, life's full of disappointments. As Adrian expressed, he was not comfortable with changing his mind, as was expressed in his quotes in our press release. He apologized for changing his mind, but that is simply what he did. And he is a very focused, talent, talented, highly talented, and motivated individual. From the day I worked with him, I thought he had something very few designers, engineers have, and that's in, in, uh, intuitiveness, you know, that he could it separated him to me from everyone else that maybe a Colin Chapman had it too. I don't know. I never worked with him. But um, when you drove for, when you had Adrian Newey as your engineer, you felt you could move mountains. It's hard to see how this saga can end well. It could end with Newey being blocked from working for either party. One thing's for sure, Jaguar and McLaren will fight over him to the bitter end. Tony, he's a four million pound a year property. You know Adrian Newin ver very well indeed. How do you think he's going to react to all this? Well, I think very badly. I think take it very badly. He's not only caught in the crossfire, but he's probably very bruised right now and, and sort of hurting quite badly over the thing. What we're going to remember is that you know, Ron Dennis is going to protect what he's got as well. He's a very persuasive individual. There are rumours that, you know, behind locked doors for four and a half hours. And, you know, Adrian will have taken a verbal battering from Ron, trying to keep his man quite legitimately, but uh, he won't be feeling good about it at all. Ron battling to keep hold of him. It's Ron Dennis's position to secure the best, retain the best, and he needs that for his technical partners like Mercedes-Benz because of the investment. He also needs it because he needs to get the best drivers available and they're only going to go with the best designer is. He's so valuable because so many people have driven cars to world championships in cars designed by him. 
Yeah, but you see, he's at the level of a top Grand Prix driver because he can make the difference. You have a good driver, you can make him even better by designing such a superb car. That's the brilliance of Newey. Okay, thank you, Tony. We have pinpointed uh, the hazard of the Welcome to Quebec ball at turn 15. Let's check the other key areas of this Gilles Villeneuve circuit. Fast straight, 200 miles an hour they go, slow corners, a big physical test. Mark and Martin Brundle, well, they've been taking a little drive round. So, Marky Boy, down to the first turn then. Pretty tough corner. Tough corner, but uh, we're just past 100 board. That's where we're going to be braking during the race. You know, 190 miles an hour on entry to this corner. About 160, 155 maybe for the beginning of the race when they come for turn one. Difficult though at the start, isn't it? Everybody focused on the same piece of tarmac at the same time. It tends to concertina up through the field and we see a lot of incidents in here on the first lap. Well, we're all trying to get the same racetrack and we've seen it time and time again at Montreal. Turn one, there's always been an incident. And really, look how tight it is. It, there isn't a lot of road, is there? The runoff's small. We're going to see smoking tyres and for sure an incident during the weekend. Crucial corner, you've got to straight afterwards and you've got to get the power on nice and early. But what a brilliant natural theatre to watch a Formula One car and driver at work. Yeah, great atmosphere in Montreal. Um, of course, this is not a permanent road course. It's actually like a temporary track in a park environment. And they put it on specially for the Grand Prix. But uh, it, it is a great place. Look at the backdrop of the city. You've got the water next year. We don't get to see any of that in a Grand Prix car, but it's great to enjoy it now. But it's all about these chicanes. Big braking, a lot of traction, a little bit of understeers nice on the way out of some of these uh, corners. They all tend to open up and give you a bit of freedom, don't they? They do, but you know, when we're in the cockpit of a race car, you come into like the entry for here, it's blind. You can't see when you turn in. So you've really got to pinpoint, get your apex, and be nice and crisp on the exit. And every time you come to an exit, nine times out of ten around Montreal, you're facing a concrete wall. So the hairpin, 190 miles an hour, down to first gear and just 40 miles an hour. Great place for overtaking, Mark. Yeah, for me, Martin, this was the only place you could overtake, but not without incident. You remember the Villeneuve and the Schumacher deal? Yeah, Ralph being rear-ended by a very optimistic move from Villeneuve. That was in the rain, but in any conditions, this is a slippery racetrack, isn't it? Well, harsh winters. I mean, it's a great day today, sun, but look at the racetrack here. Look, look at the splits. It gets very bumpy as well, and it's all about winter, four or five inches of snow in Montreal. Yep, so then you've got to somehow find some grip on the way out, put your 800 horsepower down, but with today's technology, it's a lot easier for the drivers in the traction zone. Well, trash control does it all for them now, but at the same point, yeah, you're right, 800 horsepower, right foot, it's all about exit, all the way down to that last chicane, and you've got to get it precise and carry the speed. So the final chicane, fastest part of the racetrack, 200 miles an hour down to about 70 or 80, third gear, new improved kerbs for this year, hey? Brings tears to your eyes, I would imagine, Marky. Well, I tell you, a modern day Formula One car and these are not made for each other by any means. And the big issue is gonna be, if you click one of those at the beginning, it's gonna launch the car, you're gonna end up over here, and what do we have? Concrete wall. Despite some of the finest technology in the world, a Formula One car will not turn when it's flying through the air, and Nick Heidfeld demonstrates it's a very painful accident when you take a bite out of that wall. A bit like a ski jump, those curbs, Mark, aren't they? Uh, to give you an idea of what we just saw in the film there, this credit card here, those curbs are as big as that. But what you've got to remember is that those cars travelling at 150 miles an hour, they've only got 10 millimetres of ride height. 10 mil credit card doesn't go. Listen, I hope you keep on the straight and narrow next weekend at Le Mans. Both you and Martin driving there. Good luck. How are you going to go? I think we'll be fine. I'm in the MG, Martin's in the Bentley, so uh, <laughs> side by side until the finish. <laughs> you can tell us all about it in a couple of weeks' time, anyway. Now then, Michael Schumacher's four victories here, making the most successful driver in the history of the Canadian Grand Prix. You want to find out a bit more about what's happened here over the years? Well, Murray Walker has seen the lot. Since 1978, the Canadian Grand Prix has been held at Montreal on a superb 2.7 mile circuit which circles a man-made island in the St Lawrence Seaway. It's a superb setting with the high-rise buildings of the city in the background and it's renowned for really exciting racing. 1978, which was my first full year of Formula One commentary, was also Montreal's first Grand Prix, and it saw Canada's hero, its very own Gilles Villeneuve, win for the first time in a Ferrari. 
a very heady mix. Villeneuve wins and 100,000 cheering Canadians go wild with delight at the first ever Grand Prix win by a Canadian in, of all places, Canada. 1979 was a real thriller, a race-long duel between Australia's Alan Jones and Gilles Villeneuve. It was Williams versus Ferrari, nose to tail all the way for 70 gruelling laps until Jones managed to squeeze through. Villeneuve is seeing Jones in his mirrors all the time as they come down to the hairpin to take another lap and Jones is through, Jones closes right up on Villeneuve, he's got the inside line, they touch and Villeneuve drifts out wide and Alan Jones is in the lead at two-thirds distance and Jones kept in front to win by a mere one second. Alan Jones wins the Canadian Grand Prix. Two years later, Gilles Villeneuve was tragically killed in Belgium, and Canada's misery was compounded by the horrific death of Ricardo Pelletti at the 1982 race. But then the 90s, and in 91, Nigel Mansell waving to the crowd on his last lap threw the win away as his engine revs died. He's stopping! Nigel Mansell, just a few hundred yards from the flag on the last lap. He's stopping, he's banging his steering wheel in frustration. Something has happened, it looks as though he's out of the race. 1992, Mansell in the wars again as he tried to pass Senna's McLaren. There's a spin, and that is Man Mansell. Mansell spun. Well, this is terrible for the British driver. He's going right. He looks as though he's out of the race. Then in 1995, the most emotional win of all, when John Alesi took his only Formula One victory in Ferrari number 27. Gilles Villeneuve's team and number. Canada went mad. John Alesi wins the Canadian Grand Prix to euphoric applause all the way round. Everyone will be delighted. Real, real emotion and happiness. Alesi absolutely overjoyed and he's every reason to be. 1998 saw one of the sport's most spectacular crashes. At the start, Alex Woods outbreaked himself and chaos. Schumacher second. Schumacher has passed Mika Hakkinen already. Oh. And he's going for the lead and off goes. Now they're going to stop the race, no doubt about that at all. Just look at this replay as Woods barrel rolls out of contention. But for seeing top men get it wrong, 1999 was the year. Three world champions, Damon Hill, Jacques Villeneuve and Michael Schumacher, all lost the plot at the chicane. And Michael Schumacher is threading his way through the field. He's oh, 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 Mark Schumacher out of the race. Michael Schumacher slams out of turn 13 into the wall. And with three potential winners out, the race was gifted to the McLarens. Michael Schumacher's won four times in Canada, more than anyone else, and he's on a roll this year. Can he do it again? Well, he's got to be favourite, but in Montreal, you never know. Great memories, Murray. Thanks for that. By the way, if you're a budding young commentator, that means under 18, you fancy being the Murray Walker of the future, check out the competition on the ITV F1 website. The winner gets to meet Murray later in the year. Make your weekend a total blast. That is the Montreal message. The locals say the summer starts when the Grand Prix comes to town. We'll be talking to that fellow David Coulthard, World Championship contender. We'll also hear from course expert Giancarlo Fisichella. And when you rejoin us, there is Martin Brundle's Gridwalk 2. in Montreal just under 20 minutes to go to the start of the Grand Prix that massive ball behind our studio one of the city's landmarks built for Expo 67 the biosphere primarily an exhibition center and you just see the 76 Olympic Stadium there in the background I just wonder what sort of exhibition we can expect from David Coulthard hate to tell you this he had rotten luck here last time he has never been on the podium James Allen reporting
David Coulthard goes into this afternoon's Canadian Grand Prix as clear leader of the McLaren team. He was ahead of Mika Hakkinen at this stage last year, but the Finns surged back into contention. This year, Coulthard is clearly McLaren's point man. But though that's good news for the Scot, the bad news is that his two launch control disasters have cost him a possible 20 points, and he now trails Michael Schumacher by 12. I would obviously prefer to be 12 points ahead than 12 behind, but you know we, we've still got some good circuits coming up, and I think we've got some developments coming in the car, and um, you know we're going to do everything we can to, to try and win the championship. Canada has not been kind to the Scot. He's always qualified strongly here, but he's never finished higher than fourth. This year, qualifying has been the problem, and he hopes the race will be a different story. I think actually this is probably my, my weakest performance in qualifying in all the years I've been here. Um, last year, if you remember, Michael and I were separated by less than half a tenth, and, uh, and it, it was a genuine battle here. I just haven't been entirely happy with the car, even when we were at the front of the times. You know, when I was talking with Ron this morning, I was saying, look, we've still got work to do. We're still, we're still not quite where we need to be, and, and that's proved to be the case. And maybe, maybe this year, not being quite as quick in qualifying will mean we have a reliable car and everything will work, and I'll do my job, and we'll come through and win it. After McLaren's recent problems on the start line, Coulthard's motto this weekend is to finish first, first you must start. He will use launch control today though, and he has one objective. Our goal is to try and win the race, and uh, then you, you, you sort of review your weekend thereafter, but I still think we have a quick race car. We, we think that we have the potential for good strategy, and tyres might be an issue, but obviously Michael and I are on the same tyres, so uh, we should have similar problems if we have them. He's finished every race this year in the points, and there's a steeliness about him, which wasn't there in previous years. The summer races often see a swing in championship fortunes. Coulthard is very much in the hunt let Schumacher get any further ahead that's for sure in contrast to David Coulthard this is a lucky circuit for Giancarlo Fisichella and Benetton will take anything going at the moment they make no secret of that elsewhere though Formula One isn't such an open book Louise Goodman explains there's not been much to smile about in the Benetton camp this year Giancarlo Fisichella has fared slightly better than teammate Jensen Button and scored the team's only point of the season. But both drivers have struggled with an unwieldy mount that more often than not is trailing at the back of the field. Fisichella lines up 18th today, so a fifth successive podium finish here in Montreal will be a pretty tall order. I like the city, I like the circuit, so it's always nice to be here for me. But this year we have to be realistic and I think uh, get to the, on the podium is going to be very difficult. At the moment, uh, my job is just to be quicker than my, than my teammate. I'm doing very well, but I'm sure Jensen uh, is going to be quicker uh, at the end of the season. Your contract with Benetton expires at the end of this year. What do you see for your future? I'm quite confident to be still here even next year. Uh, it's my target because uh, Renault is back to win and if it's not this year, it's going to be the ne next year, hopefully. Sorry sir, team personnel only. Formula One has come in for criticism this weekend for giving the locals the cold shoulder. The traditional track open day was cancelled by the race organisers, who cited the growing tendency amongst the teams to erect screens around their garages as the reason for the lockout. It's done nothing to dispel Formula One's elitist image. It's great to be on top of a pyramid, but uh, you're, the pyramid is as high as the, the base is wide. And if we, we don't uh, uh, take the fans' um, uh, position into consideration, eventually they will i think we will lose them and and formula one will lose uh, at the same time the teams claim the cover-up is necessary to protect their technology from prying eyes and industrial espionage it's a vicious circle i agree that the teams must be open to all the people who come but not at the cost of losing all your technology so somewhere along the line we're going to have to do something uh, to control it and i'm sure that's on the way it will happen now because everybody's talking about it a lot of people spend their hard-earned money and and you know dedicate their lives to following the sport and uh, and yet you just can't abuse that or you can't just take that for granted i think you have to um, we are entertainment Let's have a word with Mark Blundell about that, Mark. You raced in Formula 1, you went to Champ Cars, you're now back around the Formula 1 business. Is F1 a bit precious? Oh, it's changed a lot, but at the same point, if you're spending $250 million, you know, would you give away your trade secrets to your competitors? Of course you wouldn't, but the downside's for the fan, and that's the big difference between American racing and Formula 1. F1 will have to address it at some point. 
Okay, well, no shortage of fans here. As you can see, the circuit, we're on a man-made island in the St. Lawrence Seaway, side of the rowing basin for the 1976 Olympic Games. Let's join Louise. She's delving away behind the scenes. Just going to take you on a quick tour around the paddock here, because it's quite an unusual setup here in Montreal. If you look through to the back of this Jaguar hospitality area, you can see the Olympic rowing lake, which Jim was just referring to. It's quite good for fishing, by all accounts, although it's not quite as glamorous as the Monaco Harbour. In fact, all of the facilities here are a wee bit substandard by Formula One standards anyway. The teams don't have their multi-million dollar motorhomes. This is a flyaway race. They've all stayed back in Europe, so they have to make do with these glorified camper vans instead. And they don't have the luxury of their race transporters either. If I just take you across this walkway, we can have a quick peek into the back of the Jaguar garage. As you can see, it's all a wee bit crowded in here. These are the packing cases that the teams will bring the, uh, the equipment out to the races in. Now, this area is normally a hive of activity. It's a bit quiet at the moment. That's because all the action is taking place through that garage and out on the track. And I think Martin Brunt is there right now. Thanks, Louise, and welcome to the grid. We're in the middle of the grid today. Nick Cage, the actor, and Jim Carrey, the actor, too. They're on the grid, but they're heading up the posh end. I thought we'd go down the second half of the grid today. There's a lot of interest going on. Villeneuve here, uh, alongside another Indy 500 winner, Montoya. Uh, great timing there for the air display. The two side by side. There's been some amazing words between them. Apparently, uh, Montoya making some pretty uh, awful some pretty awful uh, comments to Villeneuve. He, Villeneuve had him by the throat. I tried to speak to Juan Paulo. He says, I know what you want to talk about and I don't need to talk about it today. And that's fair enough because he wants to get his head into gear. But, you know, what's the philosophy down the back end of the grid? How do these people approach the Grand Prix? And uh, often we, we spend our time up there. Let's see if we can get a bit of an idea of what's going on down here. And uh, Frentzen having, uh, well, Zonta, of course, taking over Frentzen's position. We've got the and arrows down there. Let's have a word with Tom. We saw plenty of the arrows in um, in Monaco, of course, with the... Tom, have you got a couple of minutes? <laughs> so, uh, we're just interested. We're talking about the second half of the grid. What's your philosophy, Tom? Are you, do you go about this motor race thinking, how do we win it? Or are you racing the people immediately around you? How do you go about today? Well, you've got to try and figure out how you can race the ones that are around you and just in front so you can get in the tail end of the points. So you had a lot of uh, aggro in Monte Carlo. They took your front, uh, that extra front wing you had off. You were pretty angry about that. Yeah, because it complied with the regulations perfectly. We had it approved beforehand, and it was just taken off as a whim, really, by the by the organisers. But anyway, that's Monaco, and it's behind us now. So Bernoldi, there was a lot of fuss about that, and Coulthard. Do you really think he should have held him up so long? Don't you think he actually compromised his own race too much in the end? No, I don't think so. I mean, you're Coulthard's manager, so you obviously think that uh, that we should have let David pass. But at the end of the race, if David had finished sixth and Bernoldi seventh, how was he going to feel? You know, David was at the back of the grid because his car had a problem, and they were fighting for 15th place, and that was it. And if you look at the stats, no matter what happened, David would never have finished any higher than he did in the race. Yeah, I agree, because he'd have only caught other people up in front of Bernoldi. But anyway, let's hope you have a, a more fun day today and less aggro, Tom. Thanks for talking to us. Let's wander a little bit further along. Now, here's a little bit more aggro. De La Rosa, the top Jaguar driver this weekend, he's already in the car, of course, holding up Eddie Irvine on his final qualifying lap. And Irv the Swerve, not at all happy. Let's have a word with his manager, Zana Rini. Zana, is your man happy? A little bit happier today after, you know, the warm-up this morning. Found out what went wrong yesterday. So a little bit of regret because we are starting from the back. But hopeful for the future, huh? Okay, so he's still confident he can do something. Thanks for talking to us. Let's have a quick word with Jackie Stewart, finally. Jackie, if I can uh, stop uh, my... Ca and we can turn around here. Jackie, uh, you're with the Jaguar team, of course. What do you think the chances are from right back here? Well, I, I mean, the biggest chance is staying out of trouble in the first corner, Martin, as you know. It's the wrong place to be for the sort of incident that normally occurs here in Montreal. A lot of business up front. You could easily get involved in a lot of damage. OK, who do you think is going to win this race, Jackie, finally? I think Michael Schumacher's dominated all weekend. If his car stays together, the only guy that can compete is David Coulthard. OK, thank you, and back to you in the studio. There he is, uh, Michael Schumacher, odds-on favourite to win here today as Jackie Stewart has just pointed out the first corner here in Montreal can be a little horror and today we have to factor in an extra ingredient that is launch control David Coulthard starting behind the Schumachers and David Coulthard really needing his best Montreal drive 
ever. They really do go at a heck of a lick here. Ralph Schumacher up there alongside his brother on the front row. They'll hit speeds of 200 miles an hour. And the wall beckons the careless at turn 15. We're almost ready to go then. The Canadian Grand Prix is coming up for you very shortly.